So the last speaker had a really good dad joke. Okay, you guys ready for this? You might have heard it. I'm stuck on this now. Okay. How did the hacker get away from the FBI? He ran somewhere. <laughs> Isn't that good? Isn't that good? All right, we ready, Alex? The collective groan. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, good afternoon. We've made it through almost the first day of B-Size Las Vegas. How y'all feeling? Oh, fantastic, fantastic. We have the amazing Dr. Matt Ware with us today, this afternoon. Password 911 Authentication Adventures in Healthcare. So somebody earlier said he saw him talk 16 years ago. So let's give it up for this man. He's been talking a long time. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, let me get some stuff out of the way real quick. First of all, your cell phones, turn them off. Again, unless it's God or somebody's dying, we don't want to hear it. Or at least turn the ringer off, okay? Uh, I want to take a shout out for our sponsors, the Diamond, Adobe, our Gold, Prism Cloud, Blue Cat, Plex Truck, Toyota, all that good stuff. So without further ado, Dr. Ware, take it away. Cool. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be back at PasswordsCon. Um, the last time I spoke in person was in 2019 in uh, uh, PasswordsCon in Sweden, and uh, a few things happened in the healthcare world since then there. Uh, so uh, it's really good to be back here and talking about passwords and healthcare, which are two of my great big passions here. So in my day job, I'm a cybersecurity researcher focusing on trying to figure out the cyber resiliency for medical systems. So I both look at kind of the impact analysis side, so like a vulnerability comes out, you know, what is it going to be the, the clinical or the patient impact of this vulnerability? I also looked at this from the de defensive side as well, of like how do we go ahead and design systems so when that next vulnerability comes out, they still are, uh, you know, resilient. It, patients can still have care uh, and we can still go ahead and uh, do a good job. So as part of this too, um, I'm also a member of the Biohacking Village. Uh, so if any of you will show up at DEF CON uh, over the next couple of days, uh, we're going to have some medical devices for you to be able to hack and learn on, maybe apply some of these lessons that I talk about here too. Um, a side tangent, um, I was really pleasantly surprised by how easy it was to get medical equipment through TSA security. Like I, I was coming through here, I was like, okay, this is going to be the cover story. This looks dodgy as hell. You know, you know, how are we going to get this through here? And um, you know, no problem. They were like, okay, it's not a bottle of water. We don't care. Uh, so just right on through. <laughs> Um, so, um, as it was mentioned a little bit earlier, I, I have been doing this a long time. I'm a long time member of the John Ripper uh, password cracking team because while um, I'm passionate about medical device security, uh, I am absolutely obsessed about password cracking. So, you know, whenever I get to, you know, combine these two things together here, uh, it's just a great day for me. So um, kind of talking about how long I've done this here, uh, I was one of the first researchers to study the Rocky password list. So I was able to go ahead and grab it online. Uh, I did, published you know, some analysis of this here. Other researchers were interested, so I shared the list with them. So if you're sick of the Rocky password list, I'm really sorry, okay? <laughs> um, but uh, if you want to ever have some good stories about that, uh, talk to me afterwards about this. So. One thing, though, I really got to have a disclaimer here is I am not a medical doctor. Don't let this lab coat here, you know, fool you. Um, I got my uh, doctorate in, uh, in computer science and was really try I'm trying to model how people create and use passwords. And out of this came this PCFG password guest generator. And I've been talking about that for a long time, so this is a passwords con, so if you'll just, you know, uh, give me a little bit of latitude, I want to talk about this a little bit more. Oh, and also, before I can continue, uh, if you're asking, like, why I don't actually get any work done, you know, it's just because of these, uh, you know, two uh, little hellions here. Uh, so they're always walking across my keyboard and generating really good random passwords for me. So when I talk about the, you know, PCFG password cracking, you know, the, the kind of the base question is, you know, what actually is that? And so the, the official term is it stands for probabilistic context-free grammar. And this probably doesn't mean anything to anybody here unless you're really into computer science or a grammar nerd or something else along those lines. And so I went ahead and I renamed it uh, the pretty cool fuzzy guesser. And this kind of better describes what this actually does here. Uh, so basically you train this on sets of disclosed passwords. It uses machine learning to go ahead and figure out probabilities associated with all the different types of mangling rules that people use. So, you know, sometimes you'll put, you know, uh, it capitalizes the first letter, they'll cap or, but they'll also capitalize the last letter at a certain probability. You know, people usually add numbers to the end of their password, but sometimes they add numbers to the beginning or they replace letters with numbers. And so what this uh, 
uh, pretty cool fuzzy guesser does here is it goes ahead and takes all the information and then generates pr uh, passwords in probability order. So it'll get generate the first uh, most probable get password guess, the second most probable password guess, and so on. And as you can imagine, this is really useful if you're trying to go ahead and crack passwords. So I'm not going to talk too much about this because I really want to focus on medical device cybersecurity. Uh, but there has been some work in this uh, um, here that I just want to briefly mention. So the, the first thing that I've had really recently here is a default Russian rule set because I believe in kind of sharing this all around, not just focusing on all of us English speakers. Uh, so it's uh, got a lot of new support now for you know, cracking Cyrillic passwords. And you can find out more about that if you go ahead and read the developer's guide. I also added in Honeyword and synthetic password generation. So what this does here is instead of generating the most probable password guess and then the second most probable one, it actually generates it according to the distribution that you would normally see in a normal population. So it generates essentially fake password dumps. So these are passwords dumps that look very realistic to what you find in the real world. And the question is like, why would you want to do that there? And really the kind of the main use case for this here is being able to help provision quickly large deception environments. Uh, because no one wants to go ahead and you know generate a thousand you know uh, Active Directory user passwords by hand, and so this is a really good way to be able to make that uh, you know be able to fool an adversary. Uh, based upon this, though, uh, I also added in what's called a weighted random walk guess generation. So this generates password guesses the same way. So it will go ahead and just kind of randomly walk through the grammar and generate passwords. So by default, it'll generate you know the most probable password guesses first, but it kind of go walks around and it causes a lot of you know duplicates as well. So the question is, you know, why would I go ahead and do that? And the simple fact is that the PCFG uh, uh, password guess generator is slow. It's really, really slow. So like it cracks passwords, but you know, you generally want to go ahead and use other attack modes if you're not targeting something that's really computationally expensive. With this weighted random walk though, um, it's fast. You know, you don't have to keep track of states, so the memory requirements don't change over time. Uh, it's highly parallelizable because each guess is independent of each other. And what this really means is that it, you know, it really kind of hopefully scales to a GPU password cracking type of a, a method here. So just to give you a preview of what I'll be talking about next year hopefully, is I really want to go ahead and get this included into Hashcat there. So that's going to be kind of uh, my go goal there. But that's all really kind of to the side, uh, you know, because, you know, what I really want to talk to you about, though, is passwords in hospitals. Uh, because this is something that's really important there. You know, with password cracking, you know, we're, we're getting better. You know, that's, I won't say it's a solved problem. The next talk we're going to hear is going to be really trying to get into that last hard part of it there. Um, but, you know, there's a lot more problems here with, uh, you know, trying to secure hospitals. You know, how do we go ahead and uh, be able to provide care in a kind of a hostile threat environment? And it definitely is a hostile threat environment too. Hospitals are absolutely under attack. So the, the primary people that are targeting them right now is your standard kind of ransomware type of, uh, you know, criminal organization there. Uh, because they like the money and hospitals have money. I mean, that's really kind of what it comes down to there. So, you know, kind of as, if you look at what they're doing right now, it's kind of the standard that you see across any other industry there. They, they, they break in, they, they encrypt the files, they demand a ransom payment in order to decrypt them um, in order to do that. Uh, but um, hospitals have luckily, and this is a really good uh, development here, have gone better at being able to respond to this because being able to provide uninterrupted clin uh, you know, clinical care is kind of core to their mission. So Unfortunately, the attackers, they don't go, well, okay, no, this is getting harder. We're just going to walk away and target other industries. Uh, they've definitely been going ahead and changing their tactics as well. Uh, so recently we've been seeing them go ahead and start trying to target like hospital support structures like voice over IP systems. And, you know, it's really hard to run a hospital if you don't have a phone. Um, you know, different departments need to call each other. Patients need to be able to call it. So when a phone system goes down in a hospital, it's a really bad day. Uh, the other new tactic that's really been kind of popping up lately, and this is a really um, just horrible one, is extortion of patient medical data. So they'll go ahead and they'll break into the, the hospital, they'll steal very sensitive patient data, and then the hospital won't pay them because they're going ahead and they have recovery procedures in place to be able to respond to that there. So the hackers then reach out to the patients and say, hey, look, we're going to go ahead and publish this very, very sensitive data about you online and then tell everyone you know about about that sensitive data unless this hospital over here that has all the millions of dollars goes ahead and pays the ransom. And so they're getting the patients now to try to, you know, pressure the hospitals in order to pay the ransom so that this data doesn't get leaked. And so you can see this is, a, this is a really important problem for us to be able to solve because we're all future medical patients, hopefully. You know, we, you know if we live long enough, we are going to go ahead and end up in these types of systems here. And so and so the same goes for everyone that we love and care about. Uh, so being able to provide safe and effective health care is a really important topic that I'm very passionate about. Now, one thing, and this, one of the reasons why I want to give this talk, though, is because our solutions have to fit into a clinical setting. 
Um, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that there. And so it, this is really causes a lot of problems because a clinical setting is very different from your typical enterprise uh, system there. You don't want, you know, someone to go ahead and reboot the, you know, the uh, infusion pumps or something like that there when you're in the middle of get, receiving treatment there. You know, you don't want your anesthesiologist to forget their password as they're trying to log into their computer or something like that. Um, you don't want, you know, password change policies to suddenly break systems that are providing care. So trying to figure out, you know, how we can go ahead and secure the system and apply, you know, strong password, uh, you know, policies and authentication uh, uh, mitigations into this here is really important. So I could keep on ranting about this, but I really talk, ran, rather talk about, you know, case studies here. So the first one I really want to talk about is control substance infusion pumps. So these are very common devices you'll find across hospitals and they're used to dispense pain medication. Uh, so, you know, any of the really good drugs uh, there that you can think of there, they, they generally fall into this here. And you don't want patients just to go ahead and open them up and start reaching in and start squeezing that, you know, bag of morphine really hard there. Uh, so pretty much the defining feature of a controlled substance infusion pump is a lock and key. So like here's one model here, there's where the key goes. Here's where, uh, you know, well, I guess that's a lock, but you know, you know, there they go for the, uh, that. So if you go ahead and see a device with like, you know, dispensing drugs that, you know, has a key, that's probably a controlled substance infusion pump. So this is probably the most, you know, common basic security password type of a, you know, paradigm ever. You know, you got something that's really valuable. You don't want people to go ahead and just grab it. So you put a door on there, you put a key on that door or lock on that door and you call it a day. So this is pretty kind of a standard, uh, you know, password type of a problem. So what if I told you though, that this is also kind of a standard issue that comes up a lot is about key reuse. And specifically, it's a common practice across all these different manufacturers here that they will use the exact same key on all of their devices. So, uh, for example, like if you go down to the hospital down here uh, on the strip, uh, you know, you, you know what type of infusion pump they have. Uh, you can go ahead and get the key really easy and go ahead and log right in or, and, and open it right on up. And as, as I said, this is very similar to for all these pumps. So this is a pretty much a universal thing. I'm not trying to give, you know, individual manufacturers a hard time. Uh, the only kind of disclaimer that I have is that you have a lot of these kind of third party, you know, plastic cases they put on there and there's not really standardization of the keys for those simply because there's not standardization between the manufacturers. So this is the audience participation part here to, to talk. But is this a problem? Okay, we have some re really, you know, you know, important stuff. We don't want patients going ahead and squeezing it. We don't want people stealing it. We put a lock on there. We use the same key for every single lock all around the world. Um, is this okay? No. <laughs> well, I would actually argue it is okay um, because you know you have to be physically close to this uh, in order to be able to do this. This is not a remote attack, and if you start going ahead and opening up these infusion pumps and squeezing that bag really wicked hard, you know the nurses might want to stop you as well. And you know, <laughs> so you know this is not a huge problem. And at this on the other side there. Um, physicians and nurses and everybody else need to be able to get in these pumps very quickly. And so these keys have to be very reliable uh, because you don't want that to jam when you're going ahead and trying to go ahead and change, you know, a patient's medication. Uh, you also can't really change your treatment plans while that key is locked as well. So you have to be able to unlock it because you don't want patients pressing that button as well. So making sure that lock is really reliable, uh, that can be opened in all types of situations. It has a, you know, a strong failure mode and stuff like that there that you have to worry about. is really important for providing patient care. So there's not really been any, uh, uh, you know, uh, examples as far as I know either of, you know, patients actually compromising this. So, you know, the chances of someone, you know, having that key around their wrist when they get in a motorcycle accident is pretty low. So this is kind of an acceptable trade-off that, you know, most people take when it comes to uh, password security or, you know, authentication issues when it comes to infusion pumps. So let's take this up a notch though. Should your pacemaker have a password? <laughs> I know, yeah, the, everyone's kind of sucking in. It's like, yeah, that, that seems like something that would be really important there. You know, we don't want people just going ahead and logging into pacemakers. And pacemakers are absolutely very connected. Um, like right here, I mean, you see like a, a cell phone, okay? You don't want just everyone, you know, walking by, you know, logging into your pacemaker there. And this, this is very important to enable. People always ask like, why are we enabling this? Well, this is providing information to your, uh, your doctor about, you know, how that pacemaker is functioning. Uh, it, often pacemakers need to be tuned around and, and stuff like that there because it's, you know, it's a, it's a very delicate type of a thing. So being able to provide that level of reporting saves lives. So we can't go ahead and just say, we're going to go ahead and disconnect all these devices, make them dumb devices. We have to be able to enable this. But like, even looking at this, like, how does that pairing work? Like, 
there's not a button on there I can push. Like, you know, when I go to like pair my cell phone, what's that do? I do need to do like 15 minutes of cardio or something like that there in order to like get my heart rate up and, uh, you know, accept that request. And I mean, the short answer, and there's a couple of different ways to do this here, is that uh, you'll have an app, you'll go ahead and you'll enter in your serial number into that app. It goes out to the, the manufacturer and the manufacturer gives you kind of a rotating pin that you can then use in order to go ahead and pair your cell phone with your pacemaker. So. I know we, we have a lot of security experts watching this right now, and you're like, okay, SMS, okay, that's a problem sometimes, there's, there's challenges with this. You know, how random is this serial number that there's actually being generated for someone to be able to guess? There's a lot of different rabbit holes that we can go down into the security of this here. Uh, but before we do, I just want to point out another different use case that will kind of uh, negate a lot of that. And that is the pacemaker physician programmers. So the cell phones generally just report data about that, that, that operation there. Uh, but you know, physicians need to be able to, to modify that treatment plan of those pacemakers as well. So these programmers, not only can they read data, but they can go ahead and set the settings of your pacemaker as well. And so that's really serious. And the other challenge is that often these devices need to operate in kind of an offline environment. You don't want to say, like, I'm sorry, we can't deliver life, you know, giving care because our internet is off. Uh, so, you know, these, pace, uh, these physician programmers need to be able to access pretty much, you know, anybody's uh, pacemaker. And this can happen whether you're here in Vegas, whether you're at home, whether you're in Australia or, uh, or anywhere else you might want to need to be able to receive uh, medical care. And so these uh, programs are kind of interesting. Each manufacturer has a different one, so you'll often see them like, just kind of stacked one upon each other in the hospital there. Uh, each of these will also be running, you know, a bunch of different apps on there for each different model that they want to be able to be able to support. If you look at that GUI and you're like, wow, that's really old. Yeah, you're right. It's about, you know, three years old there. Uh, but, you know, you have a GUI that works in a hospital, you know, healthcare system. I mean, why, why bother to update that there? So how do you secure this? Okay, this is something that has to be able to access pretty much anybody's pacemaker. You have to be able to go ahead and distribute this, you know, all over the world, basically. Uh, you can't really have that you know, functionality to phone home to a centralized database to be able to receive these, you know, whatever security code that you have. Like, how do you... Like, how does this work with passwords? Um, so, like, one thing they might start to think, though, is, like, maybe the manufacturer really has some proprietary algorithm that no one can reverse engineer. Or maybe we, like, hard code the password onto here and, you know, really try to keep these programmers safe. You know, we really try to lock them down and ensure that they don't get out into the wrong hands and, oh, well, that's not going to work. Um, so, <laughs> you know... These things show up on eBay as well. They, you know, be maintain, being able to maintain physical security of these, these devices is very hard. So one thing I just want to highlight is, you know, I've looked at this here. I actually haven't bought one of these. Uh, doing uh, pacemaker research is actually really hard because you don't want to be like, oh, I wonder what this does, and then someone just drops dead outside your hallway. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is definitely something that you need to worry about. When we talk about, you know, the, the threat level to be able to do this here, you know, adversaries, if they really want to be able to get into this here, uh, there are definitely ways that they can be able to obtain these types of devices. Now, I want to take a kind of a step back, though, okay? Uh, and it really just kind of um, ground this because um, I don't want anyone to leave this scared, okay? These devices, they save lives, full stop. I have people that I know and care about that have connected pacemakers, and I am okay with that because the, the, the value of this, the care that they're receiving from that there is way outside the risk that they could potentially be having. There's also no evidence of any implantable devices being exploited in the wild. So while we're basically talking about theoretical attacks that could potentially happen, they're not saying that's currently being exploited. And then the level of expertise and resources to develop these work and exploit is non-trivial, okay? It does take work. And luckily, the Venn diagram of people that have the technical skill to be able to do this and people who want to kill people is pretty low, uh, you know, as far as overlap goes. And, but... I want to have a better story than this, and this is why I'm giving this talk here. It's because I really want to inspire everybody here to really start trying to figure out better solutions. Uh, because, you know, we have to enable this connect fu connected functionality. We have to even add to this connected functionality, make it even better, make it more connected so that we can get started getting data and, uh, in order to save pe people's lives. But we also want this to be safe, and we don't want to have any caveats. We don't want to have anybody worried about whether they're going to be hacked by their pacemaker or not. So we really need to get together as a community and figure out, you know, secure solutions in order to be able to, you know, address problems like this. 
So some of the key topics I'm going to be really talking about here and kind of harping on is, uh, you know, first of all, when we talk about medical devices and stuff like that, what we're really talking about is medical systems. Like everyone focuses on the end device that you can buy on eBay, but it's connected to all these other different types of systems. And that's the whole reason why we're making that connected in the first place. So trying to understand the whole security of the system of systems is extremely important. The other thing I really want to highlight is the idea of resiliency. So, you know, devices are going to get hacked, keys are going to get leaked. The, the real important question is, you know, how do we still, you know, maintain and deliver safe care to people when these problems happen? So, for example, like what's the pacemaker option? We might not be able to have a password with that. So what else can we do? Maybe, we, and I know this is a hard problem to ask for, you know, at a password con conference, but like are there non-password solutions that we can have? You know, uh, for example, like can we have better reporting? So that way we can say, you know, if something does happen, we're able to detect it very early and we're able to respond to it. Uh, one thing that manufacturers do is they have safeguards in these pacemakers. Um, mostly they're from a safety standpoint. You don't want the physician to like hit the wrong key or their key, have to walk over their keyboard or something like that. And all of a sudden, you know, for it to you know, cause harm to a uh, patient. Uh, so a lot of times these devices, you can give them, you know, you know, bad data, uh, but they'll fail into a safe mode that will still provide, you know, not great care, but at least some level of care uh, for them. So maybe you go ahead and start doing that in order to be able to better secure it. So even though, you know, anybody can log into this uh, pacemaker, uh, they have a harder time actually causing actual physical harm. But what I really want to inspire people to do is start thinking like oh, as a system of systems and outside the box of how do we go ahead and secure and enable these really hard uh, um, uh, clinical use cases. So let's have another, uh, you know, uh, case study here. Stored credentials. We've heard about this quite a bit, actually, uh, from all the previous talks that we've had uh, throughout the day here, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this later, too. So medical devices store credentials just like everything else. So here's a CVE, and it's basically for an infusion pump, and I'm, I'm sorry about all the words, um, but really what it boils down to is that uh, the CVE came out and said that, you know, an attacker may be able to obtain unencrypted wireless network authentication credentials to the hospital. Uh, by disassembling one of these infusion pump units and just reading the flash drive. So the, the caveat there was, you know, you know, accessing internal flash memory requires specialized tools, and then, like, nurses might get a little bit annoyed at you, too, if you're going ahead and just, you know, unscrewing these uh, on the, uh, the ward there. Um, so that was really kind of what it was saying there, and, you know, the, the kind of mitigation saying that this wasn't a really big problem. So my question to the group, did, I, I want this to be a little bit more interactive, you know, is this a problem? You know, Wi-Fi credentials to the hospital stored on a medical device that you have to physically open up in order to extract a flash drive in order to read. Who thinks that's a problem? Oh, we got a few hands here. Okay, guess what? I'm with you there, okay? Because it, that doesn't have to be in a hospital when you go ahead and extract that data. So here's a bunch of dis the infusion pumps in that CVE listing there. Um, they're a lot cheaper, so we went ahead and bought one. Um, <laughs> And so here is that infusion pump in our lab. Uh, we name everything after Simpsons characters in our lab because that brings me a lot of joy. Um, <laughs> and so, like, you know, there's me opening up. There's a tamper-evident uh, seal that was just a sticker. And I'm actually kind of cool with that security feature because, um, you know, it doesn't, it, I'm not going to report it myself, so having a really good tamper-evident seal doesn't, isn't that important. And it's probably worth that one penny so the board biomed just doesn't start unscrewing it and, uh, you know, and when they're messing around with it and stuff like that. You know, there's the flash card uh, in it. Um, and so there's me with the you know, proof of life of that flash card there. So, you know, being able to, uh, you know, uh, pull that out is a very realistic, you know, type of a, a threat there. Now, one thing I want to say, though, is, you know, after all that work there, I actually didn't find any uh, credentials on that particular model there. Uh, but what I will say is I have found lots of Wi-Fi credentials on other eBay purchase equipment that we've bought as well there. Uh, so this is absolutely a very real thing. Um, um, the disclosure is always a, a pain as well. <laughs> because she's like, you know, it's like, oh, my God, I hope there's not patient data on here as well. Um, but uh, so you, you have a lot of fun talks with lawyers uh, when this happens here. Uh, so this is an example, though, of device retirement. Uh, so this is something that all devices go through. You know, uh, the device, you know, gets used and someday it doesn't get used. It gets, you know, replaced. It's either thrown out or sold on the secondary market. Um, and then you need to make sure that, um, you know, that's done securely there because, you know, people don't change their pa Wi-Fi passwords very much, especially in, uh, you know, high value env environments there. So 
One thing that I really kind of believe in is the idea of threat modeling. And so this is something that, you know, our team's really been involved in quite a bit. Uh, a couple of years ago, we published a playbook for mo uh, threat modeling medical devices. Uh, this was um, uh, sponsored by the FDA uh, to uh, really try to get threat modeling involved in early on in the development of medical uh, devices there. And uh, throughout this, we have the idea of kind of example of high value data flows. And these are common things that like a lot of medical devices do that have a lot of security problems. So like device retirement, that has a lot of security challenges that can occur there. It'd really be nice if we started seeing like, you know, more advanced techniques like TPMs or you know, other types of things. Like your cell phone you know, is pretty good at being able to secure all these different things even if you lose it you know, somewhere. Um, so there's a lot of different other kind of high value data flows that you know, tend to trip people up as well. So in this uh, playbook, what we did was uh, we have a bunch of example, uh, you know, fake, but you know, realistic kind of looking medical devices. Um, and we start walking through kind of, you know, how you go ahead and do threat modeling of these devices, as well as common problems that occur. So like a big one that we have is software update. You know, software update is a, a really important thing. We want to be able to make these medical devices be uh, responsive uh, to attacks when they come out. So being able to update software provides a really good mechanism for that there. Uh, but it's really hard to do secure software update. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And so one other research question I kind of like to put out to the whole audience here is, um, you know, how do you do this? And how do we make this easier for medical device manufacturers to actually implement? Because trying to implement secure software update, especially for some of these, you know, not real-time operating systems and stuff like that there, is actually non-trivial. And if you're wondering, like, do people get them wrong? Absolutely. Okay, uh, so here's another uh, CVE. Uh, this was also for another infusion pump. And basically it says, application does not restrict the upload of malicious files during firmware upload update. So there was no device signing, there's no authentication. You just plop an executable in there, it's like, sure, sounds good, and it goes ahead and installs it. So like, I'm not the greatest hacker in the world, <laughs> but you know, even that level there, I can go ahead and be able to deal with. So this is another example, though, from the you know, credential management and stuff like that there, of being able to, you know, properly sign software updates, be able to distribute them out there correctly and stuff like that is a really hard problem to be able to solve that pops up in pretty much all these different types of medical devices out there. Now, I've been giving a lot of different uh, infusion pump examples here. And, um, you know, it, the initial thing might be like, oh, my God, you know, infusion pumps are really insecure. And not completely wrong. Uh, but, uh, you know, the reason why we see all these different vulnerabilities pop up about, about, about them there is really it comes down to they're cheaper than MRI machines. When you start looking at other medical devices, you see a lot of the same problems. Uh, that's actually one of the things where I love being in uh, cybersecurity for medical devices is because it feels like I went into a, like a time machine. And I'm suddenly back in the 1990s like, oh, look, Telnet. Hey, cool. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement uh, in medical device security in order to be able to uh, get them to start using more modern protocols and uh, be more resilient here. Uh, but I have to say, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic um, because, you know, the security research that we're doing right now is having a huge impact. And I really do believe that security research acts a lot like a vaccine there. You know, you're, you're basically stressing uh, the organism uh, in a way that's, you know, safe. And it develops defenses against, you know, what those stressors are. And so in this case, it's cybersecurity. We're stressing these infusion pumps here. And across the industry, we're really seeing that infusion pumps and infusion pump manufacturers are really kind of taking uh, notice. So there's a lot more guides of how they go ahead and secure devices securely. And they're, they're starting to implement much, much better security there. Uh, the real big problem, though, is legacy systems. You know, hospitals just don't go ahead and update their systems all, uh, you know, all the time there. So these systems that you hang around for a long, long period of time. And then the other thing that I really think is kind of important is how do we, you know, translate the lessons learned from these types of devices and this type of research there to all the other types of devices in the hospital? Because we don't want to go through this long, painful process with every single device in that hospital. It'd be really nice if we could kind of learn from everything and go ahead and develop more secure solutions and really apply that to other people as well there. So I've been on my high horse a little bit too long here. So let's talk more about, you know, other types of examples uh, that, you know, kind of pop up here in uh, healthcare. So health, electronic health record systems are really kind of the, the core of any sort of hospital. If you follow any sort of cable from any medical device in a hospital and you follow it long enough through all the different wiring closets and stuff like that there, eventually you're going to end up at an EHR system, okay? Because this has all the data about all the patients that you care about. 
So this is a, uh, you know, what we use in the lab. We have uh, open EMR because it's free. And uh, once again, that's kind of nice. Uh, but this is actually uh, an, uh, an EHR that's actually used in a lot of smaller organizations as well because it's free. And you don't want to have the billion dollars to spend on Epic or Cerner. Um, so um, we also just, um, and just kind of a, a quick shout out, uh, we use uh, synthetic patient records for this. So there's a project called Cynthia that allows you to generate very uh, realistic synthetic patients. Uh, so this will have, you know, they'll have the proper co comorbidities. So you're not having like a, a baby with dementia. Um, so uh, if you squint it, it looks like, you know, a realistic patient. And that way you don't have to worry about dealing with NAPII when you're doing any of your research there. So these electronic health record systems, though, they need to be connected to a lot of different other types of systems. And so you start thinking about this, and you look back at the, the couple of you know, previous talks that we had in uh, this track here, and that means APIs. You know, everyone's you know, favorite you know, thing that we're talking about when it comes to computer security. So there's a lot of different ways to be able to connect to, to these types of systems. Um, and um, basically, one of the newer ones that's really kind of interesting is called the Fast Healthcare Interconnect Inter Interoperability Resource Number One, and it's a it's a fairly new standard. It's only about ten years old, um, and number one, as you can see, it's you know they're they're still trying to build it out, uh, but it's a lot better than the previous uh, standard uh, called HL7, uh, which um, it's. It's like vibes of a standard, kind of. It's not really a. <laughs> um, so, you know, with um, uh, uh, Fire, it's actually it's a pretty good uh, way to be able to uh, be able to uh, transfer medical records between different devices. And because it is a newer protocol, it does support other types of you know newer uh, you know uh, authentication mechanisms as well, like OAuth too. And so OWASP is, is pretty good, actually, OK? I mean, uh, I see a couple of people nodding, like, OK, you know, that's, uh, and that's not horrifying. Uh, so that, that's pretty good there. Uh, so so that's, that, that's really good, and that's really optimistic there. Uh, but the problem is, what happens when we take, you know, these protocols that we're using in a hospital, and we start trying to go ahead and use them to enable other types of healthcare delivery op options there? So a good one is kind of aging at home. You know, we want to go ahead and move more, you know, uh, medical devices and, you know, healthcare, you know, uh, systems into the house. So that way you don't actually have to go to the hospital. You can get better care at home. Uh, you want to be able to see your patient records, which is really important for everybody as well. And then we also have a lot of different other areas, too, where you, we want to be able to, um, you know, interconnect different uh, companies together. We want to be able to interconnect different services together. We want to connect this to the cloud. Um, so, you know, how does this go ahead and work? And... The, the short answer is there's some growing pains. Um, so uh, recently, um, or a couple years ago, actually, but so it was a, a number of really kind of interesting vulnerabilities came out called uh, Playing With Fire. And um, the, the work that Alyssa Knight and her team did was uh, really kind of cool. They're, they found a lot of different challenges with uh, basically trying to analyze um, uh, web apps you know, on your phone uh, that you know, connected back up to EHR type systems there. And while they found a ton of different problems, really the core one that I kind of you know, narrowed in on there was that um, a lot of these patient apps here focused on authentication but not authorization. So they would make sure that they authenticate you really well. They would make sure that you had an account on the system, that you were actually who you were talking about. And you'd say, I want everybody's record. And it goes, sure. <laughs> you know, there you go. You know, you can have whoever's record that you want there. Uh, so... What it really had come boiled down to is they didn't implement a whole lot of server-side controls. So they'd, they'd make sure that you actually had an account to get in the door. But once you're in the door, you could go ahead and take out everything that you wanted with that. And kind of the question is, you know, why didn't they hit a sink of that there? You know, that seems like a pretty really you know, basic or important type of a thing. And uh, my hypothesis, you know, kind of looking at some of our, like our EHR systems here, is hospitals really don't work that way. You know, a hospital, you're, you're not trying to say, okay, this patient only has access to this one piece of data. What you're trying to say is this medical device has access to all this type of data here. So, okay, this one can have access to your dental records. Okay, this one can have access to your x-rays here. Or this one here can have access to, you know, uh, your billing information for some reason. Um, so when you look at, you know, how you go ahead and specify authentication and authorization of with these devices here, it's really these broad categories uh, that these really focus on. So this works good in a hospital. It causes a lot of problems when you start just taking these protocols like, you know, willy-nilly and trying to move them to kind of a patient-facing app where you say, you know, I, you really only need to have access to only your data. 
And so I suspect that this is going to be an area where we're going to continue to see a lot of uh, challenges with, you know, over the coming years. And so from a security research re researcher standpoint, I would say this is something that, you know, you should probably almost immediately look at when you're trying to analyze uh, these health apps is are they actually, uh, you know, uh, having any sort of authorization as well as the authentication that they're doing there. So getting back to the patient bedside, though, um, let's talk about service pin codes. So if you find something in a hospital and it has buttons on it, it probably has a hard-coded, unchangeable service pin code that you can use in order to enter into kind of some restricted mode in that. And this is, this once again, this is a universal issue. It doesn't matter, as I said, if, if it has buttons, it has a back-end, you know, hard-coded password on this. So this is kind of, once again, here's our lab. Uh, of course, because I can't remember these, uh, we, you know, you know, wrote them down on a piece of paper and just taped them onto the device here. Um, so now I have to say, like, I've been doing password cracking for a long time. Uh, I know a lot of, you know, good reverse engineers, too, where I work. Um, so the question kind of comes down to, you know, how do we find out this data here? You know, do we have to go ahead and, you know, crack this open, you know, pull out that flashcard again, start reversing this, you know, extracting these passwords? Uh, there was a previous talk about, you know, reversing mobile applications. Do we need to go ahead and do this in order to get the, you know, that, those service pins? And uh, the short answer is uh, I'm lazy, so, no, I just go ahead and I download the manuals. And then, you know, like somewhere in there, this was like in chapter one, here's all those pin codes for that right there. <laughs> so I, I heard some people saying, oh, no, here. Uh, I guess my question to you is, is this a problem? Uh, who here thinks this is a problem right now? Okay, let's get some hands up here. Oh, we got a couple of them. Yeah, we got some wavies as well. Um, I actually will say I don't lose any sleep about this here. Okay, I don't think this is a problem because I kind of like factors around to like having that physical key. Like if you're like physically there and are able to start pushing things into the button uh, and it's that there, like if, if I'm connected to that device, I'm not going to be doing that because I don't want to be like, oh, I pwned the device and you're dead. You know? Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, I really don't have too much of a problem with, you know, these, you know, physically, you have to be physically there in order to be able to access these modes. Because it's really, the main goal for this here is just to make sure that, like, a, a nurse doesn't accidentally, like, change the IP address of a device here. Or, like, you know, uh, you know a, a patient just doesn't, like, you know, start messing around with it and get into an unsafe mode here. Uh, but it's not really a, a real secure, uh, you know, access control that needs to be kept secret from everybody. So... What about hard-coded remote passwords? So this is a, um, a, a problem here. So I was kind of curious about, you know, trying to figure out, like, how big of a problem this is. So um, I work at MITRE, and so we're all about our different enumerations. We have, you know, a million different ones there. You hear about attack, CVE, CWE, and stuff like that there. So CVE, Common Vulnerability Enumeration, is a really good way to be able to kind of see, you know, what vulnerabilities have come out in devices before. Uh, but there's a lot of vulnerabilities that come out. So being able to narrow your search for them is a little bit hard sometimes. So one thing I want to kind of highlight is CWE, Common Weakness Enumeration. So you can say, you know, I want to find out this particular type of vulnerability, like, you know, use of hard-coded credentials. Uh, so why don't I go ahead and search all the CVEs for this particular CWE and see which ones pop up here. And the short answer is a lot, Okay. Um, and actually, I was surprised by how few I found, because I've done a lot of work with medical devices, and um, I've definitely seen a lot more medical devices that had hard-coded, unchangeable, remotely accessible passwords uh, than what pop up here. So this is a real problem, okay? And this is definitely something that, you know, we do need to be able to address, and this is something I'm a, I'm a lot less forgiving for, from when it comes to trying to assess the, the impact of these security vulnerabilities here. Now, there's definitely other mitigations that can be put in place in order to try to limit the damage that's done by these here. here. Uh, but, you know, this is something that, you know, you know, going forward, I would really like to see less of here. So, you know, we talked about a bunch of different types of password, you know, vulnerabilities with issue, uh, you know, different medical devices here. And I didn't offer a whole lot of solutions as well, I have to admit. And um, I'm very um, aware of that. And that's actually one of the big things that really spurred me to have this talk here is, we need more cybersecurity researchers in the medical field. Um, there's a lot of different work that needs to be done, and I, I don't want anyone to hear, leave here you know, afraid. I don't want you to be afraid of receiving medical care. Uh, I don't want you to be afraid for your, um, your loved ones here when, they, when they're receiving medical care. Uh, but I want you to leave here inspired. I want you to leave here really determined to kind of look into, you know, different types of uh, medical devices and really try to start doing some of this research. And it's, it's fun work, it's impactful work, and there's a lot of low-hanging vulnerabilities for you to be able to deal with as well there.
So one other thing I really want to be able to highlight, though, is that the solutions that you come up with have to fit into a clinical setting. Okay, you have to really always keep that patient's, you know, uh, care at the, the forefront of your mind. So uh, making sure that's available, making sure that these uh, workflows are able to work is probably the number one priority there. And so we have to make sure that we have to change our security practices around that versus trying to change, you know, these clinical care workflows in order to fit into our security uh, uh, methods here. Um, I also really am a big fan of threat modeling. Uh, so um, I really think that, you know, if people just start doing threat modeling, that really can be, a, you know, help win the war a little bit here. I mean, at least try to identify what are the threats, what are the trade-offs that we're making, and, you know, how are you going to go ahead and address those threats there as well. The other thing I really do strongly believe is that cybersecurity is too hard right now, okay? Medical device manufacturers are not going to go ahead and, you know, focus on cybersecurity. That's not a, that doesn't, you know, make money for them there. Uh, so what we need to do as a community, though, is make cybersecurity easier. So that the way it's easier for them to actually implement devices in the right way uh, than just trying to roll their own solution there. So coming up with like common practices and common libraries, like how do we go ahead and do authenticate for you know pacemakers and stuff like that there, and come up with standards for that there, I think is a really important area of research for us to go forward with here as well. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, there, you know, it's really important that we, we can't say no to all these different options. Like, someone's going to say, I want to connect, you know, this medical device to the cloud. And I mean, I, I got feelings like, no, don't do that. Don't connect that to the cloud. I don't even like connecting my home, you know, uh, you know smoke alarm to the cloud or anything else along those lines. Uh, but we really need to be able to enable this. We need to say yes. We need to be able to do this so that people are able to receive effective care going forward. So... That's really kind of my, uh, you know, stump speech here for the importance of this work. I hope that you're, uh, you know, inspired by this here. Uh, I love talking about this, so feel free to hit me up really whenever, and I will, you know, rant your ear off about this. And I really want to learn from you as well here. Uh, and also come visit the Biohacking Village later on if you actually want to hack some of these devices uh, for real as well. So what's that? Does anyone have any questions? Right in the back there. I've got a question, Matt. So I used to be a... Oh, thank you. Uh, Matt, I used to be a paramedic, and now I'm in the cybersecurity field. And I'm curious, I got two questions, one's long, one short. First one is, how do you deal with the, what's your personal philosophy on dealing with cybersecurity and medicine of that, like, emergency situations need to have, you know, break glass in case of emergency, those keys versus keeping things secure? So that's the first question. The second was, are you guys hiring? <laughs> So I'll answer the second question first, yes. Uh, so uh, talk to me afterwards. Uh, for the first one, um, I will say uh, I am all for break, break class uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I, I, once again, kind of going back to that bullet point earlier there, I think we have to be able to enable those clinical workflows. Like, I... I forget my password all the time. I mean, I, that's just the case there. I don't want to be like in the doctor's office, like I forgot my password, and they're like, well, I guess we got to operate you on you, you know, take out that medical device there. That's just not an acceptable answer that I'm willing to take. Uh, so uh, we really have to be able to enable all those break class options there. And that causes a lot of problems because that means that passwords are a lot harder. You know, we have to be able to allow people that may not, you know, be good uh, actors uh, in order to be able to break that glass as well. So coming up with uh, other resilient options, so when that glass is broken, um, you know, your house still doesn't get, you know, completely ransacked. You know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, saves for your important data or something like that there. Uh, so long story short, I'm absolutely on the break glass uh, functionality there. I'm, I'm, you know, availability and being able to provide care over, you know, following just kind of a, a, a standard uh, security thing. We need to update security in order to make, you know, enable those, uh, that, that, that functionality. Uh, yep, you have a question right there? Yep. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Matt. Great talk, obviously. Um, so kind of to pivot with that same break glass emergency sort of thing, um, I work for the Defense Health Agency. Um, and so one of the things we all be, the first thing we always say is patient care is first, right? Mm -hmm. What happens when our medical professionals start to weaponize that against us? So when we start to make what I consider the very basic cyber hygienic policies in place, they fight saying like, oh, this might kill someone. I was like, sir, your ability to watch YouTube videos is not going to kill a patient. But I can't. <laughs> but like all the veterans in the room, I'm really sorry. That's an actual real case study. Um, so so like how how do we basically, in your opinion, like what's the right balance of like, no, 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 we really want you to save people, but also don't be a dick about security. Mm -hmm. um, 
That's a real hard question, and uh, certainly one that I'm certainly struggling with myself here uh, quite a bit because I like watching YouTube videos too. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think it's a really a conversation, and that's where I'm actually kind of a fan of threat modeling. Uh, if we tell people like you guys implement a security uh, pro uh, process, and they're like, "Eh, no," um, you, you need to come back and say, "Okay, here's why," and you kind of walk them through it because if you tell people like, "Okay," Uh, you know, the hospital over there got hacked because, you know, they enabled, you know, internet access to this, uh, you know, clinician facing, you know, computer here and the malware got into that and then a ransomware to the hospital there. Uh, people can, can sort of start to understand it. And you still have to have a conversation because they're like, well, I'm not going to click on that link. Uh, but, um, you know, being able to really kind of walk through these types of threats, really try to walk through the procedures and then maybe come with an alternative option. Like, okay, you need to be able to show YouTube videos to your patients because there's a lot of useful healthcare information. Why don't we go ahead and make another laptop available for you to be able to, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, have this really important interaction that you're having with your patients as well. Uh, so I certainly haven't found a good answer to that question. It's, a, it's one that's going to continue to pop up all the time. Um, I mean, I know, like, I'm a, I'm a bad user too. Like, when my corporation says, like, okay, you need to change your password, I'm like, I've done a lot of studies that say you don't. And uh, <laughs> it's not helpful. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, having those, uh, you know, interactions and stuff like that there, uh, I, it's a really tricky, but it's a, we need to kind of come to the table with them as well to try to figure out alternate workflows for them. Uh, so, um, bot, botnets have been a very, very uh, uh, critical, uh, you know, uh, uh, attack vector for uh, all these medical devices. So, um, the, the, the problem lies with the device manufacturers not abiding by a process, supply chain, uh, uh, you know, uh, validation and stuff like that. So how do how do how does Mitre take this to the next level to uh, you know, better educate uh, the actual vendors of these uh, devices and uh, supply chain? Um, uh, so th that's a really good question there. Um, uh, so. Um, everyone has a role when it comes to the medical device security. You know, patients have a role, doctors have a role, hospitals have a role, medical device manufacturers have a role. Uh, the thing is, when you go further upstream there, um, the, the more resilient the system becomes because, like, trying to expect users to be secure is just, you know, not going to work. You know, trying to expect doctors to be secure, you know, you're going to have ex exceptions there. Trying to expect hospitals to be secure, you're going to have exceptions there. Uh, so trying to move that up and, you know, really focus on the make place manufacturers can have a huge impact uh, throughout the entire uh, industry there. Now, I mean, the, the challenge there is, you know, how do you actually inspire this? And so um, one way is, uh, you know, with legislation. So, you know, there's a whole I am the Calvary track here that really focuses on policy. Uh, but, you know, that's a that's a dirty R word there. You know, you don't you know, you have to be really careful about that as well. Uh, so the other thing I think is really kind of important is just making it easier uh, for medical device manufacturers there. Uh, so. You know, expecting them to have a cybersecurity and password and authentication expert on our team is just not realistic. I mean, there's just not a lot of those people out there, and let alone, you know, for these smaller device shops here. So, you know, having practice guides so that it, when they go ahead and say, you know, I need to make this device, I need to get it through, you know, FDA certification, I need to do, go ahead and do all this stuff here. Hey, I can go ahead and use these libraries. I can go ahead and use this, you know, follow the standard practice guide that's put, been put out there. Um, you know, that's just easier. Uh, you know, they're trying to roll your own solution and do it. So if we can go ahead and make security easy, that's really the way to be able to inspire them. And so there's different resources available for medical device manufacturers. Uh, so the NIST, uh, National Cyber Center of Excellence, uh, publishes uh, some implementation guides that are really useful for, for different areas there. Uh, so they have one for like telehealth, one for infusion pumps and so on. Um, as I mentioned, like we've, uh, you know, authored a, uh, a playbook for threat modeling medical devices. Uh, so, and you you know, now we're starting to need to be able to do threat modeling if you want to get your device through certification. So being able to kind of use some of the lessons learned in that, uh, that playbook there uh, can be very useful for you as well. Um, and then just being able to use kind of standardized libraries and, you know, there's a lot of overlap now with like IoT. So you see standards like Matter that are coming out for the IoT setting. And uh, medical devices look a lot like your smart door lock you know, or something like that sometimes too. So especially when you're starting to move them into the house. So as we start to see, you know, security features being used across other industries, trying to figure out how medical device manufacturers can implement them, uh, it's nice because then they don't have to roll that themselves. So that, once again, it's just easy for them to be able to do. So uh, long story short, the easier that we can make it uh, for them, the better off we are. And I think that's really how we uh, implement change in, 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 in the industry. Any other questions? Oh, one way in back again there. Thank you. 
Matt, going on the same uh, track, because I've seen the same thing, like these companies don't have a whole lot of budget for, for doing cybersecurity. Have it, has anyone proposed a distributed model, kind of like an, an MSSP, but for healthcare, where you have like a whole bunch of small shops pitch in a little bit to sort of pay for a cybersecurity professional that can evaluate their software to make it affordable? Um, there definitely are um, industries that are popping up there uh, because the second you say, you know, this is hard, we want to pay somebody, people are like, I can do that. Uh, so I really don't want to kind of start listing them off because I don't want this to be, uh, you know, to, to highlight one or the other. Uh, but there definitely are, uh, you know, um, you know, um, uh, especially if you go to like, let's say, a conference down there, uh, you know, down the, the way there, there'll be a lot of vendors that will be telling you how to be able to do that. Uh, and I think that's actually a, it's a very important niche to be able to do because having that cybersecurity professional and then pay, being able to pay for them, you know, on your staff is very hard to be able to do as well. Uh, so you're seeing we're seeing that a lot for hospitals uh, because they just don't have that, that cybersecurity professional on staff. They have someone to patch the systems, uh, but they don't have someone that's really you know aware of all these different types of systems that are coming into their, their hospital there. Uh, so there is a lot of outsourcing that's going on currently in the industry for that there. I don't know if that got anywhere near your question or not, but. Um, And uh, there's definitely uh, areas there. So if you're thinking of a startup, uh, that would probably not be a bad one. So. <laughs> cool. Matt, I just want to say thank you. This is a very important topic for me as well. I've been in the healthcare industry my entire career, most of it in audit compliance. And these doctors will straight up tell you, I'm not, ta I'm not doing multi-factor because somebody's going to die, right? <laughs> or, you know... Um, it's really real, especially in the public safety period, you know, these firefighters, EMS, you guys are doing your job. So I appreciate your comment about making it easy, bringing it to them. So I guess I, I, you pretty much answer my questions when it comes to supply chain, you know, vendors having that responsibility. But um, do you have any other like specific suggestions about how to make it easy? Do you think it would be more like just uh, security awareness training, you know, like having that, that, you know, that, that that hand holding, like how can we really drive it home to make these healthcare providers understand the significance of security? Um I'm still trying to figure that one out myself, just to be full disclaimer here. That's that's a really hard problem to be able to solve. Um so um I think it is kind of like a whole of industry there. Uh, so you're trying to get, um, you know, security decisions built into uh, the decision-making process for hospitals and purchasing process for hospitals is actually uh, really hard to do. And uh, there's a there's not an easy way for hospitals to be able to evaluate the security of their systems as well. Like you'll get a fact sheet from the, the medical device manufacturer saying, yeah, we're totally secure. And it's like, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're starting to see things like, you know, SBOM coming out, uh, software build of materials uh, for medical devices. Uh, but even that, um, you know, like you get a list of all the different software and device and it's like, okay, I mean, what am I going to do to make use of this, especially in a hospital setting there uh, for being able to, to incorporate this? So trying to figure out how we start making use of this type of information in order to help influence uh, purchasing decisions, I think is a, a really important area of research to be able to do to help kind of spur that there. Um, I think hospitals themselves, though, are actually kind of really coming on board. I mean, they're, they're being hacked at the end of the day. I mean, and that's a uh, tremendous uh, motivator to be secure. Uh, so the, I think the big challenge right now is that they're responding to, um, they're, they're doing triage, uh, just like any other type of medical care there. So they're responding to, um, you know, the hacks that they're dealing with right now there. So your standard, as I said, your ransomware, they're really focusing on that. If you talk to any CIO or C, uh, you know, uh, or, or, uh, you know, president of a hospital there, uh, they're going to, you know, mention their, you know, backup procedures or ability to be able to detect the adversary. Uh, but, um, when it comes to these medical devices, um, a lot of our times right now, they're like, no one's targeting them yet. So we don't really, that's not where we're going to focus focus on. And I think that's an area that um, really requires a lot of uh, work as an industry to really try to get these devices uh, secured before the hackers start focusing on them. Because, you know, once they start focusing on them, that's really going to be a bad day. So I really like want us to get ahead of that uh, curve there. So once again, not really answering your question, so I apologize, but it's, uh, it's a hard question to answer there. No matter what, there's going to be some uh, uh, quote unquote provider that can't, you can't even bother to call in to reset their own time. So, so We're getting enough. <laughs> 
Yeah, so a gentleman in the, uh, in the, the audience here just said that, you know, it was a further confirmation that working in healthcare, uh, you know, doctors and patients will just kind of do what they want. Uh, so that's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. I really enjoy talking here again. Uh, I, uh, I hope to see you again next year. You have a good B-Sides.